Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business app. One of the stories we've been featuring this morning, China and the European Union agreeing to start talks on electric vehicle tariffs. And joining us now in our studios for more discussion on this is Min Min Lo, Bloomberg China correspondent. So this is pretty interesting. Uh, We had these very high levies, as high as 48% on EVs that have been slapped on Chinese cars going that direction, Min Min. Uh, And we had Germany's Vice Chancellor Robert Habeck there saying this is a first step, but it's a first step in in an area where there were no steps before. So he's he's leaning optimistic, but then he says it will require many steps. So tell us what you know. Yeah, I would say it's been a lot of push and pull in this dynamic between German, Germany and China during uh, the German minister's trip to China. Because, I mean, first of all, well, let's talk about the, the EU-China talks first and we'll go to the German ministers later. But the, the German, uh, the EU-China talk, um, the Chinese commerce minister had a video conference call with his EU uh, trade counterpart over uh, on Saturday. And um, the EC spokesperson said that the talk was candid and substantive. He said that they will continue talks at all levels in the coming weeks, but that any negotiated outcome must address what he calls injur- injurious subsidization. Um, and again, this is what the German ministers were in China for. The, the vice chancellor there was uh, very, you know, he's been repeatedly emphasizing that these tariffs are not meant to be punitive in nature. It's meant to compensate for these unfair mm. advantages that China's uh, EV makers get. It, it seems like, I mean, I get the subsidy and But the fact remains that China at this point seems to have a lot of excess capacity in a number of industries and lower cost products are being exported to countries, let's say, in the European Union, which directly threaten, and Brian mentioned uh, Germany, the automobile industry in Germany, right? That's right. So German is, Germany is the largest automaker in China. And we know that over the past five years, in fact, China's imports of German cars had nearly halved as their domestic makers really, uh, you know, pick up market share in the domestic market. And yes, you're right. There has been this buildup of overcapacity, which is why the overseas market is really important for China, because that's where these EV makers get higher profit margin. And now they're being squeezed when it comes to profits with these uh, huge tariffs that are being slapped on China. Um, But some analysts are saying that maybe the final outcome is not about you know, just removing these tariffs altogether, but it's eventually to get perhaps some Chinese companies to invest in Europe, to pay European wages to European workers. That could perhaps, uh, you know, lessen that kind of cost advantage that Chinese um, makers get and also reduce the threat of taking away jobs from Europeans. So there is room for negotiation. There, there's a lot of scope here uh, to find ways to try to make it work uh, because obviously the two sides feel as though they want and need each other. Uh, but it's interesting that there's no timetable on this. Uh, is that just a, a you know just a technical thing, and it'll get worked out? Well. So we're about one and a half weeks away from July 4th, which is when the provisional tariffs will take Uh effect. So it's highly unlikely that any outcome will come out before that. Mm. But again, this July 4th tariffs are provisional. The final tariff rates will be decided in November. It has to be backed by the majority of EU members. So China has this window until November to convince the majority of EU members. It needs to, in fact, um, it requires uh, EU member support that represents 65% of the EU population. So China has been very strategic here because the top four most populous countries are France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So when you look at their tariffs, their investigations into these empty dumping areas, they have looked at pork, which targets Spain. They've looked at brandy, which targets France. Mm. They have hinted at 25% tariffs at vehicles with large engines, which really targets Germany and Italy because Italy sells these luxury sports cars, your Ferraris, Lamborghinis, to China as well. So very strategic here. I'm wondering whether or not we need to recognize the political winds in Europe and how they seem to be shifting and the, the risk that we get perhaps no compromise, that there is a, a firm line drawn and it results in some type of trade war. 
Yeah, that risk is getting higher with the EU elections and you see the rise of these right-leaning parties getting into the parliament. Um, and again, as I said, we saw very mixed signals coming out of the German minister's trip to China because you would expect someone of the vice chancellor's rank to meet with someone of a similar rank in China and that would be Premier Li Qiang, who is the number two man in China. But that meeting didn't happen. Hebeck himself said that he didn't know why that didn't work out, but he got to meet with other Chinese officials though, including the Commerce Minister, the head of the NDRC, which is China's macroeconomic planner. And again, as I said, that push-pull dynamic where you have Chinese, the Chinese side saying, yes, we're willing to get Chinese companies to tap the German market, but Germany, you have to step up your leadership here and get the EU to, quote, correct its wrong. And then you have the German vice chancellor also managing expectations, saying that this conflict will not be resolved in his trip here, and he cannot negotiate on behalf of the EU as well. There's so many philosophical differences is uh, between the two sides. Uh, you wonder how much can actually be uh, agreed to. Min Min, out of time, unfortunately, but thank you for coming into our studios. Min Min Lo, Bloomberg China correspondent, looking more closely here at China and the European Union, and I guess a little bit of faith here, uh, agreeing to start talks on EV tariffs. Thomas Ta joins us in our studios, head of APAC Investment Strategy at BlackRock. Thomas, thanks very much for traversing uh, the traffic and coming into our studios with us. We do appreciate it. So it seems like most people, a lot of people, are are basically uh, long U.S. equity. Uh, we, we we seem like we might be seeing a little bit of a sell-off here in some of the uh, big momentum plays, uh, particularly AI. But one of the things that this market has shown us of late is that it has been absorbing some of these hits. Uh, it's been able to let some of the, the gas out uh, without having the broader market go into a, a really big downturn. We had a little bit, maybe a 5.5% uh, down run in uh, April. In any case, uh, if one is looking to diversify here, um, are there ways to do it, or would you switch out of U.S. equities and find an overweight elsewhere? Uh, yeah, morning. Um, I guess I have no excuse to traverse because our offices are about 20 meters away from each other. But um, yeah, in terms of the U.S. equity um, market rally, um, time for a breather, it looks like. Um, when you talk about broader market, um, small cap, some of the laggard um, sectors, uh, utilities, financials, energy, I mean, it's it's also obviously important to note that we have not seen anywhere near the rally that we've seen um, in large cap, mega mega cap tech um, tech and quality, um, and so you know there's a couple different scenarios here. One is the underlying data in the U.S. starts to deteriorate a little bit. We're seeing a little bit of that on the margins in terms of housing housing starts, um, consumer retail numbers, etc. Or um, the U.S. economy continues to power on, uh, and we start to see a broadening out of, of the U.S. equity rally. So, either way, I think you know now is probably a good time um, to look at diversification and broadening out into some sectors. I think most investors will be doing that through kind of a factor lens. Um, so, continuing to look at quality type of companies with strong balance sheets, uh, and then other investors will look at sector rotations. And as I mentioned, the, the sectors before are the ones that I think most investors are looking at: financials, energy, utilities these consumer staples to some um, extent. And then globally, you know, investors are, are still looking at really at, at Japan and India. I know there's a lot of debate about both of those markets and the valuations there and the BOJ and central banks, etc. Mm. Um, but uh, and then also EMX China has been a huge, um, a huge beneficiary of uh, the EM trade um, and how investors tactically rotate around China is going to be interesting to watch as well. So you, you sketched out two different scenarios very briefly in terms of where the U.S. might be headed. Do you have a degree of confidence in, in that's high in, in in one particularly? Well, I think, you know, the the underlying economy is certainly one thing. I think investors tend to underestimate what how long it takes for higher rates to trickle down into the underlying economy and for consumers to actually uh, be able to grasp that and essentially stop or, or slow down in spending. Um, uh, and then the other thing to, to, to mention is, um, you know, the, in terms of the earnings growth, you know, clearly that's been very, very strong for, for a mega cap. Um, in, if you look at the valuations, they haven't risen that much, but 
um, there is a huge uh, there's a huge emphasis on forward looking valuations and you know whether um, some of those mega cap names can continue to grow uh, at, at the significant rates that they have been growing that that I'm not so sure of so I think there is a little bit of a more defensive tilt and let's not forget obviously we are going into U.S. election cycle uh, pretty soon so I think investors are looking at maybe uh, rotation maybe taking some profit here so you're you're looking at Asia Pacific investment strategy uh, I wanted to ask you about Japan because uh, you're right, we did run a story over the weekend that said that foreign investors are, are lightening up on Japan. Mm. Uh, uh, they're starting to worry about the weakness in the yen, and uh, they're also worried about whether or not that has an impact on the economy. A couple of uh, a couple of houses mentioned uh, did not include you. In fact, uh, you were one of the examples of how you're sticking with the Japan story. Why? Yeah, well, I think, you know, versus some of um, maybe some of the investment banks and analysts, we're much more longer term strategic asset allocation. And so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's also important to clarify a couple months ago, we did this big piece on spotlight on Japan and how investors can play that. And, and the story hasn't really changed much. So one of the things we said was, in terms of the broader index rally uh, that we've been seeing over the last year, year and a half, uh, that that first leg of the structural bull market could be coming to an end. And that basically means, you know, the way that investors uh, move into Japan using just broad index funds to get any kind of exposure, Nikkei 225, topics, et cetera, um, that, that, that structural leg of the bull market, phase one, was kind, kind of coming to an end. And now I think we're in a period of, of relative uh, calm trading range, investors trying to digest what the BOJ are going to do and what the impact of rates are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And I think phase two, and again, this hasn't really changed, but investors need to be a little bit more tactical and granular on Japan because not everything is going to keep going up like it has been going up. So looking at active funds, value funds, high dividend type of exposures. And also the final thing on Japan is, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense for investors to close underweights there because, you know, even if it doesn't continue to go up as it has been going up, it, it offers diversification because it's a value-driven market and, and investors have so much growth in their portfolio at the moment. Given the enthusiasm that has finally taken hold domestically, I'm wondering if this market were to get rattled in a significant way, how sentiment just is undermined to such a degree that there's really a, a big setback as a result in, in terms of psychology. Yeah, well, I, I mean, let's not forget that, you know, retail investors have not really participated that much in the equity, the the, the Japanese equity rally over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we're still seeing around $7 trillion U.S. dollars sitting on the sidelines. Yes, there has been more participation in programs like NISA, but it's it's quite marginal. Um Inflation is 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 going up. You know that there is there are some areas where investors are concerned that maybe it's not going up like the BOJ would like it to go up. But um, you know the equity market is, has rallied. Inflation is going up, um, and you have these programs that are incentivizing investors to to move into equity markets. So I think that's really just starting. And I think uh, the domestic um, investors will be part of that, if not the, the majority of that that second leg of the structural bull market there. All right, Thomas, out of time, unfortunately. Thank you very much for joining us here in our studios. Thomas Ta, head of APAC Investment Strategy at BlackRock. Steve Sosnick, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers. Steve, thank you for joining us on an early Monday morning in Asia, late Sunday for you in the United States. Uh, we can talk a little bit about how the triple witch didn't seem to deliver as much volatility as we thought, but I, I thought maybe first we could go to, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Japan's currency chief, Masato Kanda, uh, threatening to intervene in the market. So we, we have seen a quite steady and quite fast weakening in the yen of late. Uh, a warning like this, does it make a difference? Hi, Brian. Good morning to you. and Thanks for having me. Yeah, it does make a difference. Um, you know, I think one of the aspects when you, when foreign and when international investors are allocating uh, their money uh, is the currency stability or the currency outlook uh, for a given country. And in Japan, um, you know, it's tricky. You, you, either have to, you either have to consider whether you want to hedge the currency because it, it's an interesting problem, right? Because, you know, stocks tend to go up when a currency weakens, but uh, your holdings don't seem to improve if, if the currency balance is mm. balancing it out by weakening. So you've got this this issue going on, and you know instability um, is another word for volatility, and that does put investors a little bit on the on their heels when it comes to making international allocations. Hey, Steve, uh, how much of this is really a story about a strong dollar? I mean, a, a dollar that has been so supreme, it's not even funny. 
Well, Doug, I think some and some. I, I think, you know, across the, the, the scope of global currencies, it is more of a strong dollar issue. Uh, you know, remember, of course, that, that this is one of the times where the Fed is actually a bit behind its peers, where we had other central banks, uh, you, you know, cutting before the U.S. did. Um, and so that, that, you know, that interest rate differential, at least even the perceived interest rate differential that, that might persist, is definitely strengthening the dollar. Although that said, the, the Japan and the yen have their own unique set of circumstances, uh, you know, regarding yield curve control and all the other stuff you've been reporting on. So let's go back to U.S. equities, because that's very much in focus uh, as well, particularly the high flyers. NVIDIA was slammed pretty good at the end of last week. Of course, it's had you know remarkable gains uh, all year long. Uh, I'm curious whether or not uh, you think that, uh, that that's something that will continue here. And I, and I want to draw a comparison, because when people were buying Amazon back in the days when it had no earnings, it was because of the potential, and it was because of perhaps a little bit of, of hope. The same thing with Tesla. But with NVIDIA, you actually have earnings. So it's, it's a little bit trickier to, uh, to, to try to value the stock when it's, it's out of sync. The, the company's growing faster than what it is predicting and what analysts are predicting. Does that add up to volatility going forward for you, Steve? In theory, it should. Um, and, you know, because any time, again, you know, any sort of uncertainty um, does create volatility. You know, we were actually, in this case, fairly certain that this is, we, I mean, collectively, you know, the investors as a whole seemed pretty collectively certain that this was a company that could continue to beat, beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, raise their estimates, beat the raised estimate, keep doing it and, and, and do it over and over and over again. That's why the stock has had this remarkable run. But at some point you have to figure what are the limits to all this? How much more um, in, you know, how much more AI adoption will there be? You guys just reported on, you know, on Qatar and the Middle East, so there, there's some more doing it. But, you know, bear in mind that Mark Zuckerberg at the last conference call basically said it was going to take potentially years for the billions of dollars that they're spending on AI to pay off on their bottom line. And so you do have to run into the situation of, okay, we, we've got all this AI, you know, we're building all this AI potential. It, it, I, I'm going to stipulate, let's say it is the, the, the wave of the future, because with Amazon's case, the Internet was everything that was promised and then some. Mm. But, um, you know, what, is, how, what if this doesn't necessarily pan out as quickly as possible? Is there a bit of a hangover? Um, and, how, and if so, how bad does it go? And the other part being, we've become so dependent upon NVIDIA and these few market-leading stocks. What happens if this pullback persists? Obvious, if, if that does persist in a major way, it's probably something really not good for the markets. So a moment ago, Steve, Brian mentioned the fact that we did have that triple witching in the States on Friday, the expiration of options and futures on equities and, and stock indices. Uh, I think about five and a half trillion in notional value, which is in and of itself staggering. What did we learn from the price action Friday? I think what we learned from the price action or, or sort of the lack thereof was two things. First of all, we were expecting a bit more price action in Apple and NVIDIA. NVIDIA actually the positive side because of the rebalance of the XLK ETF. It's about an $80 billion ETF. It needed to uh, buy about $10 billion of NVIDIA and sell a similar amount of Apple. I won't get into the details of why. It's kind of a weird mechanics of the ETF itself. But neither one moved all that much. So it tells you the market was pretty good at absorbing that. And secondly, it's telling you that we've got all these funds that, that mechanically sell volatility. To some extent, they've been underperformers because really when the market goes straight up, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to be writing calls. You'd rather just hold on to things. But um, as a result, it means that a lot of the active hedgers – uh, the market makers and the professionals um, who delta hedge end up long that volatility, and as we get close to expiration, it kind of puts a ma- it kind of puts a magnet on expiring strikes um, rather than sort of providing a slingshot effect, which is why we sort of find the volatility dampening a lot of times on these major expirations, whereas they used to kind of expand a bit on these major expirations. You're so good at explaining things, Steve. Uh, Explain to our audience how um, even with all of these huge gains from companies like Eli Lilly and and Broadcom and NVIDIA, uh, that that realized volatility just isn't that great at the moment. If If you look at the VIX at 13, it suggests that, you know, that there's almost complacency there, and yet it should be a time, shouldn't it, that we have a ton of volatility. It should be because 
part of it is we're getting a bit of dispersion of results, actually quite a bit of it, because this is kind of the problem with the narrow leadership, is the moves are sort of being dampened out. You don't have much participation at all from, you know, from the vast majority of stocks that are trading, um, but yet you've got this cadre of market leaders, uh, you know, among the ones that you've mentioned, that are just propelling the market higher. So that, that, that sort of, you know, if you, if you thought about having a two-stock index and stock A goes up by 5% and stock B goes down by 5%, well, then your net move is zero. To, to expand that and scale a little bit, and when you think about market capitalization weighted indices, you, you know, the, the big ones can outweigh, can outweigh all the smaller ones, but that's kind of why we're dampening volatility. And VIX reflects the historical volatility, but I, I've always uh, asserted that it also, affa- it, it also represents institutional demand for hedging. Mm. Are institutions buying VIX and VIX-related products because it's really the easiest way to hedge a portfolio? And quite frankly, they're not. This is, this is what I used to say when I was market making, you know, was, was, you know we're, we're selling umbrellas here and nobody wants to buy them when there's a drought. Um, and that's kind of what's going on in terms of VIX. The fact that we were so heavy in volume Friday, is that, is that a bullish sign to you? 60% above the average uh, for the past month in the S&P? Very quickly, Steve. No, that's, that's just expiration. When all those options expire, you're going to get bought, and, and you have rebalancing. That's, that volume follows from that. Okay. All right, all right, Steve. We'll let you go back to the barbecue. Uh, uh, have one on us. Uh, thanks very much for joining us on a Sunday. Steve Sosnick, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.